Suzanne Copter's lab at Florida International University. I have just finished up the first year of my doctoral program, so my poster that I'm presenting to you today is uh, primarily theoretical and has some early landscape analyses. So um, any feedback you could give me would be great. So um, I'm going to introduce you to the system first. I'm working in a subtropical uh, forest system known as the Pine Rocklands. It's very similar to coastal plains, uh, pine savannas, only in this system we're on an exposed limestone ridge called the Anastasia Limestone Formation. And what also makes this unique is that it's in South Florida, as you can see on this historic map here. So it's a meeting zone for temperate and tropical species. So a lot of biogeographical uh, studies can be done in this system. And on top of that, because it's in Miami-Dade County, uh, there's been severe fragmentation events. So over 98% of this habitat has been lost in peninsular Florida. And the extent of what has been lost in the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, Cuba, and the Keys is unknown. So that's going to be part of my dissertation. Um, with this fragmentation event, uh, not only do we not know when they occurred, uh, but we also don't know the nature of the land use change. Uh, but what we do know currently is that we've had a severe fire suppression associated with this fragmentation event. And that's mostly due to management decisions. So a lot of these smaller uh, fragments, which the new distribution is in yellow, this is just a zoom into Miami-Dade County Pine Rocklands only, not in the islands. Um, a lot of these yellow patches, the current distribution, are surrounded by residential areas, uh, industrial areas, agricultural areas, and it's difficult to pull off prescribed burns in those areas. So you can imagine severe fire suppression in a pyrogenic ecosystem is affecting community assembly and succession. So what I'm really interested in is large-scale dynamics across the landscape of this system, and I'm basing a lot of my work on um, some of the meta-community theory that's coming out um, in the last 10 years. So so there's a meta-community working group. This is a figure adapted from um, one of their 2013 papers, um, which is basically bringing the concept that we used in populations, meta, um, meta populations, and bringing it up to the community level. So this figure, if I can just describe it to you, on the x-axis we've got patch size, or it could be any variable that's known to be associated with a healthy patch, high functioning, uh, it could be biodiversity or productivity. And then what you do is you plot that at the patch level for each uh, fragment of Pine Rockland or patch of uh, your um, community of interest against some metric of um, connectivity or networking. So in this case I have gene flow. So you can think of this metric, this index, as um, an indicator of um, how connected and how big of a hub this uh, patch of Pine Rockland fragment is compared to other patches. So you get a, a nice regression fit with theoretical data, <laughs> obviously, but um, these are the patches that as patch size increases, you get what you would expect, that you um, see a linear increase with patch size. But what we're really interested in are what I would deem burden patches and keystone patches. So you can think of a keystone patch just like a keystone organism, um, you know, sea urchins that have a, a higher impact on their environment than their biomass. So you can think of a fragment having higher than expected gene flow and more important to the total distribution of this community than expected. So those are going to be patches that we want to seek out for acquisition and uh, conservation efforts. Burden patches are ones that you're seeing lower gene flow than are expected for its patch size. And those are ones that we want to be more active with management regimes, right? So really push for um, increased uh, prescribed burning or alternatives to that as roller chopping. So this, uh, all of my data is going to come back and create this for the landowners and uh, management agencies. Um, but what's different about my thesis from what the Meta Community uh, Working Group has put out thus far is that I want to incorporate a spatially explicit nature to this model. And so what that basically means is it matters where the patch fits in the landscape. So for instance, on this map, um, this yellow dot here, if you can see that, is um, actually situated in 100% um, agricultural land and low density um, residential area, while a patch up in this region is surrounded by downtown Miami. And so you can expect that gene flow moving across 
the landscape going across a farm field versus going through an urban environment is going to be filtered at different rates based on traits. So um, what I'm interested in is looking at how that gene flow different, uh, differs, the rate differs, the filtration across different landscapes. So this first line here is if the matrix surrounding a patch is a preserve land, such as Everglades National Park, where a lot of the remaining pine rocklands are found, agricultural lands, or an urban environment. And so this is still in the early stages, so we may break into more categories as we learn more about the system. But at low connectivity of your patches, isolation wins out. And so you're, what you're seeing is low gene flow, right? Because the patches are so far away from one another. But as you increase, uh, uh, sorry, if you bring your patches closer together, connectivity increases, you're gonna start seeing that differential filtration effect. So I expect that uh, seeds and pollen and also their animal associated vectors will have an easier time moving through a natural landscape as opposed to um, an urban landscape. So I'm going to be testing this empirically. And so that just brings me to my four main objectives of my thesis. So like I said, this is a really early stage and I can go through a few of my methods of how I'm thinking about doing this. So. The first step is describing the current landscape distribution of the system. So I'm going to be using remote sensing, aerial imagery, GIS to characterize the landscape dynamics. So really learning how connected are the patches, how much have we lost in the last hundred years, who did we lose it to, who now owns it, and what are their management regimes. So from that, then I can select sites to do experiments to track gene flow, right? Because you need to know where the patches are to track the gene flow from patch to patch. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a whole series of, um, this is right here. So the first stage is remote sensing and aerial imagery. Then we're going to be doing structural analysis at the patch level of vegetation dynamics, soil analyses, canopy closure, all structural variables. From there, I'm going to be setting up wind pollen traps and also seed wind dispersed traps within my patch and within the matrix to try and figure out how far these things are moving into different areas. And then also I'm tracking their animal vectors, which is some of the most challenging and fun aspects because it entails me running through Everglades National Park chasing pollinators. So um, you can see here one of my field volunteers trying to catch bees and then once we catch it, we can see what pollen grains are on that bee because each plant species we're at Botany, everybody loves plants. Each plant species has unique pollen grain structure, so I can ID them using a microscope and also potentially next generation sequencing at that point. And then um, also we're gonna be looking at ma uh, mammalian scat analyses to look at seed dispersal across the landscape. So that's pretty much the summary of my dissertation and um, thank you for your time.